This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg here in South Africa. My name, of course, Eben Janssen. The show is live. It's broadcast from our studios in Northland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube right now with our entire show available on demand on our YouTube channel. Today, we look at the international response to the Ebola pandemic with Cuba leading the fight against the disease. We look at the fragile truce between Boko Haram and the Nigerian government. We conclude the Dakar debate here in South Africa, looking back at the week's highlights. And then uh, South Africa won the one day international series against New Zealand at Mount Manganui this morning. But first, let's get the top stories from Katrin Miller. Well, hello and welcome to Newsroom. I'm Katrin Malan, and let's take a look at those top stories this morning. Kasatu will convene another special central executive committee to give NUMSA a chance to defend itself against expulsion. This was the outcome of the CEC meeting that ended in Johannesburg yesterday. Speculation was rife that the meeting would decide to expel the Metal Workers Union, which is Kasatu's biggest affiliate, for various actions. Kasatu General Secretary Zwilin Zima Vavi says they have given the Labour Federation a cooling off period before convening another CEC meeting. Everybody agreed that uh, the principal issue must be that we're still wanting to save the, the Federation from any possibility of a split. Okay. And on the basis of major disagreements about how we tackle that report or related issues. And we must work hard and we must uh, give ourselves a space again. A South African company has been indicted in the United States, Alabama, for selling illegal rhino hunts to Americans and secretly trafficking in the endangered animal's horns. Company owners Darby Grunewald and his brother Janneman are facing charges of conspiracy, lazy act violations, mail fraud, money laundering and structuring bank deposits to avoid reporting requirements. Nine American hunters allegedly paid up to 650,000 rand per animal for a total of 11 hunts between 2005 and 2010. None of the hunters were charged because prosecutors said the hunters were tricked by the Grunewald into believing they were shooting legally. Botswana nationals are going to vote today in what is expected to be the country's most competitive elections in 48 years of democracy. President Ian Kama of the Botswana Democratic Party is attempting to secure a second term in face of an opposition challenge by the breakaway Botswana Movement for Democracy. Moving to Africa, suspected Boko Haram militants have reportedly kidnapped at least 25 girls in an attack on a remote town in northeastern Nigeria. This despite talks on freeing over 200 other girls taken hostage in April. The incident caused doubt over the announcement by government a week ago that a ceasefire deal was reached with Boko Haram, which would include the release of the kidnapped girls. President Barack Obama has offered federal support to New York as it responds to its first Ebola case. Efforts are underway in the United States to identify anyone who may have come into contact with the New York doctor who yesterday tested, tested positive for Ebola and became the fourth person in the U.S. to contract the deadly virus. He had recently been working in Guinea treating patients in the West African country. A new poll shows that 77% of Americans believe that the U.S. should ban travel to and from West Africa. The president has been clear uh, in his explanation about why he believes uh, a travel ban is not the best policy at this point. And the pro tiers have secured the ODI series against New Zealand with a 72-run victory in the second ODI, giving them a 2-0 lead going into Monday's final match. New Zealand were all out for 210 with 21 balls to spare, chasing 283 after they won the toss and sent South Africa in two bats. Remember, all these top stories and more are available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Katrin. This week, Cuba received international praise after the announcement that a further 91 Cuban medical professionals will be deployed to West Africa to help battle Ebola in the affected countries. Cuba's contribution of hundreds of doctors and nurses to fight Ebola has been applauded 
by many international humanitarian workers and puts the island nation at the forefront of the international response. Despite its small population and often strapped economy, Cuba has sent 165 medical professionals to Sierra Leone, a larger contingent than most Western countries. A further 91 Cuban doctors and nurses are to begin work shortly in Liberia and Guinea. And Cuba has pledged to send some 200 others. Now joining us from our studio in Pretoria is the Cuban ambassador to South Africa, Mr. Carlos Fernandez de Cosio. Good morning, Ambassador Cosio. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. A pleasure to be here. Something to be very proud of as a, as a Cuban, the, the kind of response that your nation uh, have shown this week. Why, why is it that you're doing this and the decision to send more staff this week? We believe that the disease uh, deserves an international effort to be able to cope with it. Uh, we received a, a request from the Secretary General of the United Nations and from the Director General of the World Health Organization to see what Cuba could do. And in our belief that what one needs is human resources in the field, people qualified and capable to work, we responded with what we have, which is people trained, people with the capacity to act, and people willing to act. So we are sending a total team of 461, of which over 200 already in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. Just give us a quick uh, rundown exactly what, uh, what the Cuban medical professionals will be doing there. Will they be setting up uh, centers and so forth? They will be cover, uh, attending the, the people who are falling uh, uh, victims of the disease, working in putting in place preventive measures to, to stop the spread and to prevent people from uh, acquiring the disease and to take all the sanitary measures that in our view in an epidemic uh, of this type needs to be responded to. Uh, we, we're working in the three countries and we plan to work with others. Anyone really willing to come and that's what has been our experience in the past and that is what we plan to do here. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, we saw today that uh, another medical professional has tested positive for the disease in the US now in New York City. Are you not afraid that uh, because medical professionals have been the one hardest hit uh, in these areas that you might export the disease back to your country? It is a risk that some of the uh, medical doctors and the technicians that are in place might acquire the, the disease. The approach under the guidance of WHO that we have taken is that the person infected will be treated in place and we'll try to contain the disease in place. These are organized teams, uh, disciplined. It's not logical to expect a person to be infected, not to be screened, and to end up back in Cuba or some other place. The, the aim is to contain and to fight the disease there, not to spread it around the world. Ambassador, there's been some criticism internationally that uh, Western countries refuse to, to really get involved in fighting the disease because only Africans were involved. Only when that was exported to Europe and the US did it become an international crisis. What are your, what's your response to that? Is African life valued as less in the West? It is true that it is Africans that are dying today. And it would be a huge mistake only to face this because of the fear of the epidemic reaching uh, Europe or North America. Uh, those are real risks, but the problem is that we need to face it now and save the lives of the Africans that are dying there. That's why we truly uh, believe that it is with the involvement of human resources, as I said, capable, trained, and willing human resources to go there fast, save the lives of today, the people that are dying today, by that saving lives in Africa and avoid the, the spread for the future. And finally, if you, if you could send a message to the rest of Africa and the world, uh, the countries in particular, what would that message from Cuba be today? It is only with a sense of solidarity that one would deal with this, not thinking of only one's individual interest or one's or nation's individual interest. We have to face it trying to help African countries, 
help the continent of Africa, help the world, and by that is the only way that, that, that we can help this. And you need the involvement of human resources. You need that. It's not just by sending money or sending troops. You need human resources in the field. Ambassador Costio, thank you very much for the fantastic work that Cuba is doing. I want to, before I let you go, talk about South Africa's relationship with Cuba a little bit. We also have a, an exchange program of doctors and so forth. Can you give us a little update where we are with this program? First, I should say that Cuba and South Africa truly enjoy a very successful, a very productive relationship and a friendly one that has a, a long history. Today we have exchanges of different types, and that include, as you say, the training of young South Africans as doctors in Cuba and some Cuban me medical personnel that works in most provinces in this country. Uh, it's something that both, both countries feel happy with, and uh, we hope to continue to develop for the future. Ambassador Carlos Fernandez de Cosio, the Cuban ambassador to South Africa, thank you very much for joining us today and giving us a unique insight into the fantastic work that your country is doing in dealing with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, a crisis that threatens to affect everyone on the planet. Thank you for setting such a wonderful it's a example. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, it is a fantastic example, especially to those rich countries. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It is a crisis that is affecting all of humanity. Let's take a look at what you're saying about Ebola on social media. Of course, at SABC Newsroom, that's where you can send us your inter interactions on social media. What, what, what are you saying? Saeed, Saeed Kamal Shah says, Mali confirms the first Ebola case. Real and more devastating threat to the world than terrorism. That we can all vouch for. Charles C. Johnson says, better to deny 10 Ebola-free Africans enter entry than to admit one Ebola positive patient. Yes, that is, that is unfortunately the kind, of, the kind of insular view that our American friends often have when dealing with Africa. Curls and Charisma says, if Ebola is really in New York City, I would not take the subway if I were them. Not safe. Who knows who you will come into contact with. They don't even know how the disease is transmitted. Mass hysteria in America at the moment. Travel bans have been implemented so far in 30 countries. Why not the USA? Yet Obama isn't doing anything. Uh, Obama's doing a lot, actually, in dealing with, with, with Ebola. Airport screenings are obviously not working. Well, there we have facts about Ebola in the US. You can't get Ebola through air. You can't get Ebola through water. Yeah. Can't get Ebola through food grown or legally purchased in the United States. <clears throat> if only our Americans would read, they would really know what was going on, wouldn't they? Now, we move on. Days after Nigeria's military raised hopes with the announcement that Islamic extremists had agreed to a ceasefire, Boko Haram is still fighting, and there's no word on the fate of the 219 schoolgirls still held hostage now for more than six months. Talks were expected to resume in neighboring Chad this week, but there has not been confirmation of any meeting taking place there. The official silence raises many questions, especially since Boko Haram's leader, Abu Bakr Shekau, has not confirmed that a truce has been agreed. Now, on Wednesday, a large explosion, explosion rather, rocked a bus station claiming the lives of a further five people in northern Nigeria, an area previously targeted by Boko Haram, in what appears to be the latest crack in the government's purported ceasefire with the Islamists. Just yesterday, Boko Haram militants kidnapped 25 more girls in the remote northeast Nigeria. Despite talks aimed at freeing more than 200 other female hostages, the militants seized in April of this year. Now, for the latest, we are joined by a political analyst and a man who knows everything that happens in Nigeria, Richard Irohanya. Richard, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a very interesting week. We've had a ceasefire, but fighting continues. There are cracks. We've had more kidnappings. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of a ceasefire if Boko Haram is still continuing with the terror activities that we see? Well, one thing we have got to understand is that um, 
uh, pockets of resistance or attacks after ceasefire agreements have been reached uh, is not strange you know, in conflict resolutions. So if you look at the examples of uh, yeah, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we have this kind of uh, things happening after it truce is reached, and we have pockets of resistance until normalcy is rest restored. So this is ex exactly what we appear to be experiencing in Nigeria currently. Uh, and I believe that uh, a number of, uh, there are a number of reasons that make me believe that uh, um, this time around it is going to work. Uh, it is going to work because when uh, yeah, uh, Debbie, uh, 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 the, the Chadian president is involved, Idris Deby, uh, because he negotiated the release of the, of the Cameroonian, uh, wife of Cameroonian deputy prime minister hmm. and, and, uh, and seems to command a lot of respect among the Boko Haram members. And this is also because many of the fighters are recruited from his country. So with his involvement, uh, one hopes that this time around uh, a truly ceasefire will be reached here. It's an interesting time for Nigeria the next couple of months. The, the country will be heading to the polls in February. Mm. Just sketch <coughs> us the picture how this plays out with the election very much in the forefront of pol politicians' minds, uh, these kinds of ceasefire announcement. In a way, it almost feels like a little bit of, an, uh, of electioneering if you don't have a ceasefire, but you call it that. Uh, yes, uh, if, you, if you remember, Nigerians are very skeptical about this, uh, about this, uh, uh, this development of ceasefire. In 2012, there was one and one, uh, one Abdul Aziz for there to speak for the group. It never worked out. In 2013, there was also another attempt, and, uh, uh, and one uh, uh, marijuana also proposed to speak for the group. I mean, I think Mohammed Marijuana. Uh, after after a few days, uh, the group came out to disown him or disclaim him, and uh, we, we came back to square one. And now this is 2004, so there's people who are very skeptical. But I think Good Luck Jonathan wants to achieve something. You know, be, with the, with the, uh, very in few days time, we're all few months. I don't know. We expect him to make his declaration, and the party has already adopted him as their presidential candidate. So there's not going to be a primary election for him. And I think he would like to see this problem resolved, as that will positively help him during the electionary period. But if he fails, it's going to be a minus you know, for him as he campaigns for a second, uh, for a second term. And, and you understand that uh, over a uh, over, you know, few years ago, the, the opposition has been capitalizing on this, in fact, over politicizing issues, you know, rather than uh, you know, joining forces with the federal government to resolve the problem. And uh, a lot of criticisms have been levied against them of over criticism without offering contact solutions. So I think the, the rhetoric now has reduced, and we are seeing that a more united front you know, among Nigerians. So if you keep criticizing, it is going to play against you yeah. in the other pools. And, but if you look to seek for uh, a more secure Nigeria, you are likely to get more votes from the electorate. It's very interesting you say that it's a more united Nigeria uh, uh, seemingly at the yeah, moment yeah. in dealing with this issue. <coughs> Where does the military, the Nigerian military, who at times feels like they're a little bit of a law unto themselves, where does the military fit in uh, when one thinks about the problems that you've had in the past in dealing with Boko Haram and the kind of infiltration they even have within the Nigerian military? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, uh, where the military facing is that uh, uh, the last battle against Boko Haram in Kondoga you know, actually gave them a lot of credibility. They were able to inflict massive defeats you know, of Boko Haram. And uh, there seems to be a lot of purging also from the military. We have had uh, uh, court martials of military officers you know, who have been uh, you know, convicted of one thing or the other, collaboration with Boko Haram. And, you know, uh, we don't know the effect yet, it's a military affairs. Uh, but then that shows you that the military is doing something to purge itself. And, but then there's also a problems of human rights abuses you know, that are going on uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the name of fighting Boko Haram. And uh, I think uh, the military has not, you know, come clear about this. But one yeah. thing is that they are not sending mixed signals. Uh, the government is talking more about reconciliation, more about rehabilitation, more about amnesty rather than total declaration of war, which, of course, appears to be a kind of mixed signals that they were sending before, uh, before this time. And, and, and what are the people saying in, in Nigeria, even in, in the case of a ceasefire being agreed? Would people support that uneasy ceasefire? Uh, of course, an easy ceasefire, a state of no war and no peace, is better than a state of war. Uh, uh, I think uh, Boko Haram finds out that it is not winning the public opinion war. And the, the opposition party used to provide a form of legitima uh, legitimacy for them 
uh, by criticizing the uh, federal government, but that is not happening. Yeah. And Boko Haram does not have a friendly environment where they operate. Now, if, he, if you're a guerrilla movement and you want to succeed, you must have a friendly environment in which yeah. you operate. The environment is not friendly. There are a lot of uh, 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 subgroups, uh, uh, if you like, uh, vigilante groups also fighting against them. So they are not winning. With the recent agreements reached with Niger, uh, 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 with Niger, and uh, Chad, Cameroon, and Benin Republic. The double areas are going to be they are going to have a lot of military presence. Yeah. So operation with impunity, as has been the case, is not likely to be the case again. So Boko Haram is sensing that the activities are becoming more and more Defi in, uh, difficult. Yeah. And there are, of course, enough motivation for them to enter into agreement with the federal government. And that is what I think, even with the, uh, the, the recent agreement, and is uh, likely to hold, and that uh, we are going to see a total resolution of the conflict in less than no time. Well, the world hopes that there's total resolution of the conflict shortly. And the girls are also released. And that the, the, the young women are released. Richard yes. Iranya political analyst. Thank you for joining us and, and giving us your unique insights. It's always nice to, uh, to find out what is happening in Nigeria. There's so little information that really comes out. Thank That's you once true. again. Thank you for having me. Let's take a look now at the front pages from around the globe today. Now, the International New York Times has a picture of an explosion on a hill in Syria near the Turkish border, the town there of Yumurchak on the front page. That's, uh, that's in Syria. Airstrikes from the U.S. and its allies have reportedly killed more than 500 extremists in the last month there. Then the story most other international papers are looking at is yesterday's shooting in Canada's capital. There you'll see the Australian is still looking at this soldier killed at a war memorial in Ottawa. And also focusing on that shooting is the Guardian in the United Kingdom with a picture of the man who has been identified as the lone assailant of the gun attack in that country. You're watching Newsroom. We'll be back after a short little break. Recycling one glass bottle saves enough electricity to use a lamp for over an hour. Recycling two saves enough power to make toast. Ten, to watch your favorite soapy. Recycling 30 tons saves enough energy to power a suburb. If everyone in the country recycled just one bottle a month for a year, we could light up Joburg for an evening during peak hours. Imagine, one day it might be possible to recycle enough glass to light up South Africa. The Glass Recycling Company. This former bread basket of Africa, playing host to Sadiq leaders. I feel humbled and yet greatly honored at being appointed the chairman of Sadiq. When I was a student, Harvard was only my visible college, my former classes. But I was also a student in, in an invisible college. The outbreak in West Africa is the world's deadliest to date. It's centered on Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, with cases also reported in Nigeria. Catch news at 8, 7 days a week. Be informed. Because of cancer, I realized life is short. I want to live my dream. They can bend my face, but not my voice. I'm definitely not a cross-dresser. South Africa, I'm just a gay man. Join Puleng Mulebazi on Bupilong every Saturday at 17.30 CAT. Welcome back. This is Newsroom on SABC News. Now, this week we decided to take a political turn with the hashtag Dacha debate, as it's become widely known on social media. 
We extended invites to major political parties to join us on the show and state their views on the matter. We started with the Dacha Party of South Africa, who jumped right into the mix, accusing all political parties, including the Democratic Alliance and the ANC, of being too complacent on the matter. Is it not maybe time for something like a referendum to be put forward and for the, for the people of South Africa to decide on this matter? Well, I'm a bit concerned that a referendum would be held along party political lines and those uh, parties that don't support Dacha will require their members to vote against such an issue. But remember, we are a cultural minority. The Dacha culture is a very organized and legitimate cultural minority and we're claiming our rights regardless of whether the rest of South Africa accepts it or not. Um, I, I think that... Uh, we have to f legalize Dacha. It's not a matter of whether we should or we shouldn't. Now, the debate began in light of the sad passing of Incarta Freedom Party MP Mario Oriani Ambrosini, who was a strong advocate for the legalization of medical marijuana here in South Africa. Tuesday this week, we were joined by the IFP, who once again brought Ambrosini's fight to light once again. We are way behind many other uh, first world countries uh, in the world that have permitted the use of uh, cannabis properties uh, for medicinal purposes. And it is known uh, through research that uh, uh, pain, the easing of pain, uh, can be uh, done through the use of cannabis properties. Uh, morphine is what is traditionally used at the moment and, uh, I mean, thousands of people know what the side effects of morphine are. So here is innovation, and what we are asking is that government conducts research under very strict regulations to see whether or not uh, cannabis and cannabis derivatives can be used by patients with the consent of the patient and the doctor here in South Africa. On Wednesday, we had the Democratic Alliance speaking up and responding to accusations that were thrown their way, making it clear that the party does not support the decriminalization of cannabis within our borders, despite it being legal in other countries. We do not support the decriminalization of, of marijuana. We do not support that because of the extraordinary harm it will cause to our children. We have n no confidence at all that we can keep alcohol out of the hands of minors. We've got an alcohol, a massive alcohol problem in our country. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, it's destroying our country yeah. and the young lives of South Africans. And because of that, we think that um, until we get on top of that issue, that's the real issue, yeah. not marijuana. It's a question of alcohol. We, we won't support it. Then, uh, yesterday, we were joined at the last minute by the economic freedom fighters who responded to the DA saying they are missing the point and that if cannabis were to be legalized in the country, it would be much easier to control. The U.S., which is a conservative country, has legalized not just for medicinal use, also for recreational use. And, by the way, in Colorado, which is the first of the states in the U.S. to legalize marijuana, they, have, they are showing the economic benefits and this idea that if you legalize, people are going to go into other drugs. There is no evidence for this. The other nation, which is Uruguay, Uruguay is the first nation to totally... Uh, uh, decriminalize the use of marijuana. There, the idea was that drug cartels, and as long as we, uh, they, there was a, a criminalization of marijuana, you drive this whole process underground, and drug cartels take over and basically create all un unhealthy situations, including illegal movements of the drug, and there is no, or the, making it into drugs, and there is no uh, control. Well, I'm sure that you've noticed the one major political party missing on this topic is the ANC. After extending invites and numerous calls, we were unfortunately not able to get them on the show. The door, however, remains open, and we would like to extend the invite not only to the ANC, but any other party who would like to get involved. You can reach us uh, on Twitter, at SABC Newsroom, or go to our Facebook page, forward slash SABC News. Send us your comments there also. We, we welcome that.
Now, the Dacha debate was buzzing on Twitter this week with all of your comments. Let's have a look at some of your opinions throughout the week. Uh, at SABC Newsroom, of course, is where we've been interacting. MMJ Buzz says, think of all the jobs that the cannabis industry would create at every tier, just like any other legitimate business. Legalize cannabis, says MJ Buzz. And us speak wa Africa, says, at SABC Newsroom, this ignorance will lead to more cancer-related deaths. As long as weed is illegal, an act of genocide is taking place. Wise up, says Raspik Wa Africa. Tim Hill says at SABC Newsroom, it's less harmful than booze. I say legalize it. That from Tim. Tiro says, Herb is the healing of the nation. Legalize marijuana. You are fighting a losing battle, says Tiro. And then Paco's Monkey says, legalizing municipal, municipal, municipal medicinal. Cannabis not only improves lives for the sick and suffering, but great opportunities for world-class farmers, farming. Talks about Australia and the Australian model. Penelope says, watching Channel 404 on Dacha legalization, appears the DA needs to brush up on their research at Dacha couple and so forth. That one from Penelope. And Khafalak says, okay... The EFF is pretty clueless about Dacha, but at least they are pro-legalization. That one from Khafalak.com, that is the uh, well-known Afrikaans uh, musician here in South Africa. Let's take a look at what's uh, happening on our Facebook page, what you can see there. Today, you can read more about our neighboring country, Botswana, heading to the polls. Uh, there, the Botswana Electoral Commission says everything is in place and it is all systems go for the country's 11th general elections today. Then, a doctor in New York who recently returned from Guinea has tested positive for Ebola. He's currently being held in isolation at a city hospital there. And you'll see that the Congress of South African Trade Unions, Kasatu, will convene another special central executive committee meeting to give the National Union of Metal Workers a chance to defend itself against expulsion. All of these and more, you can find it on Newsroom Facebook page. You can also go to sabc.co.za forward slash news for all the latest updates on all of the top stories, not just of the day, but of the week. And you know, it's finally Friday. And we at Newsroom hope you've ha you have your dancing shoes ready, whether you'll be dancing or not. We hope you'll be having just as much fun as this little eight-year-old guy. Just have a look. He's enjoying the life. the hype is about the new cap and how about the new cabinet uh, will actually perform but what role should then the media be playing at this critical stage I, I would hope that the media will give the newly appointed people a benefit of the doubt has the media lost its respect in this regard we want you to tell us the many factors that are hidden from the public in terms of this ought to be brought out by the media watch media monitor with me alicia jolly sundays at 9 a.m only on the sabc news channel Healthy food is not always the cheapest food option. And so making the healthy choices, the easier choices, remain a health challenge for South African children. Bipolar disorder is said to affect one in a hundred people. Low back pain, 
the most common spinal disorder affects about 8 out of 10 people at some point in their lives. Back pain persists for more than a week or two. Seek advice. I'm Dr. Silla Mutawu. Watch Health Talk every Saturday on SABC. Zoom into Africa. This is Kenya. The president is Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta. Kenya got independent from the United Kingdom on 12 December 1963. The population is more than 42 million people. One of the major languages spoken is English. Monetary unit is Kenya Shilling. Back here with Newsroom on SADC News. Let's take a look at the morning's headlines. Kusatu will convene another special central executive committee to give NUMSA a chance to defend itself against expulsion. This was the outcome of the CEC meeting that ended in Johannesburg yesterday. Speculation was rife that the meeting would decide to expel the Metal Workers Union, which is Kusatu's biggest affiliate, for various actions. Kusatu General Secretary Zulazima Vavi says they have given the Labour Federation a cooling off period before convening another CEC meeting. Botswana nationals are going to vote today in what is expected to be the country's most competitive election in 48 years of democracy. President Ian Kama of the Botswana Democratic Party is attempting to secure a second term in the face of an opposition challenge by the breakaway Botswana Movement for Democracy. President Barack Obama has offered federal support to New York as it responds to its first Ebola case. Efforts are underway in the United States to identify anyone who may have come into contact with the New York doctor who yesterday tested positive for Ebola and became the fourth person in the U.S. to contract the deadly virus. He had recently been working in Guinea treating patients in the West African country. A new poll shows that 77% of Americans believe that the U.S. should ban travel to and from West Africa. And the Proteas have secured the ODI series against New Zealand with a 72-run victory in the second ODI, giving them a 2-0 lead going into Monday's final match. New Zealand were all out for 210 with 21 balls to spare, chasing 283 after they won the toss and sent South Africa in to bat. Remember, all these top stories are available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Eben, over to you. Thank you very much, Katrina. In sport... All roads are leading to Cape Town this weekend. The Western Cape searching for their first victory in a home final at Newlands since 2001 when they go up against the rampant Golden Lions in the 2014 showpiece in South Africa, the Curry Cup final tomorrow. The last time the two met in a Curry Cup final date back nearly three decades to 1986 when Province hosted uh, the then Transvaal at Newlands. Province beat the visiting side by 22 points to 9 for their fifth consecutive Curry Cup title. Now, our sports reporter in Cape Town is Craig Marais, a passionate Western Province supporter. Uh, very good morning to you, Craig. Thank you for joining us. It's going to be a tough day. Good to old... be with you and your. <laughs> it's it's going to be a tough day in Cape Town. Just before we talk about the, about the game itself. It must have been fever pitch, the kind of vibe on the streets in Cape Town this week, if, if, if one can just read, believe what you're reading. No, it is. Um, the, the, the fever's there, but uh, there's a lot of nervous um, fever as well, and quite rightly, because the Lions have been so, so impressive. So um, big support, obviously, for Western Province, but especially the way the Lions beat the Sharks last week, um, there's a lot of nervous. There's not overconfidence at all. And they're still reminded what happened last year. They were unbeaten in the Curry Cup until the Sharks came to Cape Town and, and dismantled Western Province. So it, it, it's a really 50-50 hardest game, which is great. That's what you want. You, you're not, you're not, it's a very difficult game to call, Eben. Province, though, they should not be underestimated. They, they finished top of the log again. They played a very exciting brand of rugby. And then playing at the coast is a little bit different from playing on the high felt, one would think. 
That is the huge thing, you know, um, for all the people out there. But when you when you speak to coaches and players, they, um, Alistair could hear them say it's always difficult for the Sharks, Western Province, when the coastal teams go to Alice Park. Um, it's just the altitude. You're running on bone bone hard grass. Everything's a lot quicker. But when we and the Lions are they're just brilliant at Alice Park, and they they're very good at other venues. But um, this is a record. Western Province have won nine out of their last ten games against the Lions at at Newlands. So, you know, it, it will level the playing fields a little bit. At the same time, like last year as well, um, that home advantage can often can be a burden on your back as well when things don't go well. Um, speaking to Alistair Kutsia and John de Jong uh, just in the week, it's all going to start in that set piece, and, and that's where the Lions probably have got the advantage in that scrum. And interesting enough, when they announced the team yesterday, the Lions have a, another a second front row on the bench, whereas Western Province, um, they've, they've dropped Oliver Kevill. Um, so that's going to be one thing. There's been a lot of talk about the scrums there, even because Bali Swat has gone about to say how good the Lions um, scrum is. And Alistair Kutsia was very, very defensive because the Lions might, you know, you might have a dominant scrum, but you, you still have to scrum legally. You must do it legally. You've got to scrum straight. So Craig, Craig Joubert, the referee, will have a big say tomorrow. Both teams have played sparkling rugby this season. But finals are often not that. Finals are often very tense, very dour, very tactical affairs. Do you expect this to be an all-action running fest? Uh, I, I, like you say, Urban, you know, normally the finals can be very disappointing because of the pressure. But I think these two teams, especially the Lions, that's the only game plan they have. That's the, 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 but in a final, I just watch Western Province practicing drop kicks. There is certain things, you know, you have to make the right decisions. You have to take your opportunities. The Lions seem to attack from all over, although Monats Boshoff has got a good kicking game on him. And Western Province are more sort of, um, you know, from... from Counter, counter play, and, and when they when, when they when they when they steal ball. So I expect the game to be be the same. Um, the big thing, as I say, will be the scrums. And Western Province got such a good defence; they know that they have to tackle the Lions, because the Lions against the Sharks made them look very good. If they if, they, if you miss tackles and they they allowed to offload, they will be rampant. Western Province will be very um, worked a lot on their defence to actually push them back in push them back in the tackle. And um, that will be province's thing to have that home advantage, tackle them back, keep the set pieces fairly even, and then hopefully the crowd will get behind them. You've got to be careful also the Lions. Um, Derek Minnie, and they've got brilliant loose forwards. I think the Lions are the favourites. They're the better team. But um, whether they'll be the better team at a final at Newlands is another thing. Yeah, that crowd will be immense. It will be a test atmosphere, no <laughs> doubt. Talking about test rugby, though, you were with a box the whole week in Stellenbosch. They were there training hard on the Obas Malkotter field, uh, I, I, I saw yeah. in the papers. <laughs> Tell us a little bit there about, uh, about the kind of work they did. It looked like they focused on fitness a lot this week. Correct. A lot of, um, lot of um, conditioning. First of all, the big thing about them was that, um, you know, the, the Springboks, they normally play in the Curry Cup. So this year they're not because it's the World Cup. So they've never really had a two-week break since they beat the All Blacks. So that two-week break was, a, was great for them mentally and physically. And now they're working on their, on their conditioning. And um, they basically got eight test matches. They, they want to be successful at the end of year tour, but it's eight test matches to the World Cup. So you can't really work on things at the World Cup. You work on them now. So lots of conditioning. And then they want to keep the momentum going as well at uh, the end of year tour. They've done very, they haven't lost a game the last two years. So they, they want to work on that. There was quite a few injured players they kept in the loop. Um, the Willem Alberts and the Flip van der Mervis, Peter Steff, the toys. Um, so a lot of momentum. They, they want to get better and better. They, they feel that their conditioning got better to compete with the yeah. All Blacks. But now this two weeks and the weeks, the time, they, it's, it's more time to work on that conditioning. And also because the World Cup in um, September next year is in Britain. And at the end of your tour, it's a great time to gel, to work on their conditioning and familiarize themselves yeah with the conditions that the World Cup will be next year. One more thing on, on, on the box. The announcement of the team is on Monday, I think around 11 o'clock in the morning. Any surprises? Maybe Nazir, Nizam Khan maybe making the, making the trip, end of year trip? Chance of that? Uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the team chosen on Monday and then the camp will move to, uh, move to Johannesburg. Apparently, there's, there's not going to be that many changes. They, they want to keep the continuity going. I, th I think there will be one or two new caps. 
Um, the, the Lions front row, there'll be a couple of guys there. I, I'm just worried for Nizam Kha, someone like that, you know, because he, he might not even play in the final. He's struggling. But apparently the, what they do, they try and choose a, a Springbok team a couple of weeks ago after that All Black Test match. So when guys come with brilliant performances in one or two games, that, that's not enough. It, it's a team is chosen a few, a few weeks ago. Mm. So um, I, think the, I don't think to think there'll be too many changes, but it's always nice to, uh, certainly the front row and that Lions front row has done it, um, very well. And maybe someone like Nizam Khan, maybe a, a, Sir, a Sir Bela Sinatla as well, who's um, that bit of X factor. Yeah, the gas man's been playing fantastic well. Quickly, Craig. <laughs> The Proteas won again today, but New Zealand look well under par, don't they? Yeah, it's a combination here, but New Zealand under par. We've actually caught them a bit, um, you know, cold because they haven't been playing much cricket. But it still takes a lot. The players suffered a lot from jet lag um, to get to New Zealand. They're just a confident bunch here, and uh, you know, this three-tier leadership with Hashim Amla, the captain of the Test team, AB, the One Days, and Faf in the T20s. They, they're just such a solid unit um, on and off the field. No clicks, um, clicks like in the days gone past. They're very mature. The, the, lead, the leadership is spread also. There's JP Dermany in the mix. You've got um, uh, Mornay Morkel, Vernon Philander, Dale mm -hmm. Stein, the bowling unit as well. So they're looking very, very good. Um, they, they, it still takes some doing where the game could be tight. The, that maturity now with A.B. Yeah. de Villiers, Hashim Amlas, the JP Dermany are really taking them through. They're looking very good. And um, if they can have a successful tour in Australia, things are looking very good for them when that World Cup starts in Australia, New Zealand, February, March. Thank you very much, Craig Murray, for giving us a heads up in the sports field. Big weekend for Craig Murray. Of course, he is following Western Province passionately. And I can tell you that Western Province will be up against the men from Gauteng, yeah, uh, the land of milk and money, as we call it here yeah, in Johannesburg. Now, quick comments before we carry on. Wasifa says, is this what awaits us next year? Bring it. Official CSA talking about the, the, talking about, uh, the, uh, the cricket this morning. Great performance. Sunil says, well played. Amla Hash and Faf, of course, they got South Africa through. Were on song to well-deserved victory. Yes, it was. Great performance by them. Aslam Sajri says, both favorite players, Hash and A.B. de Villiers, have given the best displays. Really enjoyed. Yes, it was. It was fantastic. Fantastic performance, fantastic performance by the Proteas and very well done. Well, today we end on a bit of a high. He's an up-and-coming local hip-hop and Ikasi rap artist. He's performed at one of the biggest African hip-hop concerts, Back to the City. He's also a songwriter and producer as a young musician hailing from Soweto. He fell in love with music at the tender age. He's known for his impeccable punchlines and his smooth, smooth storytelling lyrics. Now, his name is Spuda P, and he joins us in studio today. He's going to perform for us as well to go out. But Spuda, before we, be, before we get you to, to go live for us, just tell us your inspiration and what are the things that got you to be the artist that you are today. Um, I started rapping in 2002 when I got inspired by... Uh, Pasta Rhymes with a track called Bounds. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. Um, I fell in love with hip hop because there's uh, enough freedom of expression. Uh, so, yeah, that's how I got it. it. It's not a lot of swearing in the freedom of expression, is there? Uh, I don't swear. <laughs> Some swear. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Tell us, your music is now played on all the top radio stations here around South Africa. Ukozi, YFM, the likes, they, they, they love your work. Yes. How has this changed your life and changed your, and changed your career? Um, no, uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no much change, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm still on the build-up. Uh, so I'm, I'm still building a brand, you know. So, yeah, I was, that, when I was playing on... Uh, on the on the other radio stations, I was I was I was building up for for an album, you know. So, well, yeah. you can build it up properly now. Take us away. It's put up E in the house, uh, hip hop, uh, hip hop, and Ikasi rap artist here in the newsroom studio. Let's go. Time 
the sun. Let's go. 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 You wouldn't date me if I wasn't famous. Why you pay it up? Why you jealous? It's not my nagging, there's nothing that can tell us. How you could you know when you're the best I know? You don't have to around and check your playlist though. Let me check you out, baby, go and change your clothes. See how I'm busy, you get my pony more. Dile la buena, Sandra. Dile la buena, Sandra. Dile la buena.